Okay, so here's we're talking about the filter and the screen. Screen, you're gonna change oil how often? 25 hours. Um, the spin on? 50 for most circumstances. All right, I'm looking through my notes and they're a little, I gotta straighten them out. They're a little out of whack here. I'm gonna get everything covered, but uh, poo, it's gonna be, well, why'd you put that there? Um, let's see, so anything other than, than a very small amount of metal, very small amount, this amount of metal, should be investigated. Okay, so investigation, that does not necessarily mean, okay, I got some metal coming out that I'm going to now tear apart the whole engine. Uh, that would be a little excessive, but you definitely don't want to just ignore it, right? Document it, check it, have the, go fly the airplane shorter intervals, keep checking, see if it comes back, see if it doesn't, see what's going on. Um, let's see, we'll put this, consider the source. Source, okay, so if we, we take a sampling or we wash the, the media or the screen or whatever we have, don't forget I told you continentals go from the outside in, so heavy stuff is gonna go to the screen and then fall. So when you pull the screen out, you gotta wipe in there and you gotta look and see what's on the bottom. Um, on radial engines, they have the tank, but they also have a sump. It's a little narrow sump between two cylinders. And in our shop, as a policy, there's a little drain plug. You pull that out and drain that oil, and then take a magnet and run it around in there because sometimes the thrust bearing would dump a ball in there. Yeah. Then you go fly it and see if there's another ball. No, then it's time for... Okay, so consider the source. So we do this. Let's say we have non-magnetic material. What could it be? Yes, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> From where? Let's let's try. Let's try doing this. I hate this show because, but anyway, Family Feud style. There, number one answer. Safety wire. Crankcase. Uh, crankcase. And uh, for you, Tobias. Eh. <laughs> I get one ice. <laughs> Piston. Um, should have another one on here. Okay, piston. Piston and plugs. I would say number one answer is plugs. What else? I didn't say it's aluminum, I said it's not magnetic. <laughs> it's definitely non magnetic. <laughs> <laughs> talking metallic, though. Bushings. bushings. What color would the bushings be? Brass, bronze. Hey, bushings are becoming, a, that should probably be moved up towards number one because both Continental and Lycoming are having some problems with their bushings, right? Lycoming's, you had to take them apart. You had to do this test on them with the spring and see if the bushing was gonna push out. I told you all about that because they weren't broached in, I don't think. Uh, Continental wants you to run all your oil now through a certain micron screen as you drain it out of the engine into the screen and take a look and see if there's any big parts. So come on, give me something else. Rocker arms are steel. Rings? Rings are steel. Bearing material. Probably not likely, but you'll see it flake off. You'll see flakes of it, actually, is what you see. So I shouldn't say it's not likely. You see it all the time. Little metal flakes, very thin. It flakes off. All right. What about metallic? What about magnetic? Magnetic. I mean, all of the things we just got wrong. The steel stuff. Yeah, steel stuff. Yeah. 
get valves. What are you gonna get valve pieces in the? Maybe. I don't know. Oh, no. Let me see, how many do I got? I only have two here. <laughs> All right, but I heard cam and lifters, number one answer. If your lifter starts looking like this one, you might see some pieces, or you might not, you know? Probably would. Cam and lifters and? Uh, usually not gears, I don't see. Rings and cylinder walls. <coughs> <laughs> Usually not big pieces, but you know, could be. All right, that's what I got. Huh? That's it. Now here's where my notes just like why. Then I realized I didn't even finish talking about some of the stuff that I was started talking about. We started talking about engines with dry sumps and wet sumps and different kind of sumps and let me see and I just just I don't know it's like a page was missing out of my brain there uh, are you gonna be all right over there all right so I don't have notes for you so you're gonna have to make your own notes if it's something you wish to remember what kind of it is this wet sump or dry sump a wet sump. So let's talk about this. We talked about it with the light coming over there. So I'll get my laser pointer. So we've got an oil pickup tube, and I do believe we'd covered this a little bit. I don't know how this is supposed to be working here because it's got oil sump pickup tube, and it just kind of goes over here. And then it's, I think, yeah, I don't know what they, and somehow magically it goes up here to the gears around the outside, back through the oil filter. And then we'll take pick it up from here. So it's going to come through here. And the first thing it's going to run into is oil temperature control valve, sometimes called a vernathern valve. Now, in order for that to be effective, there's got to be another path. Can't just be one path because they're showing it as it goes this way and into here, and that's just the end of it. Well, you got to have a path that either says through the cooler or not through the cooler. So. Right, and or, or, or if you're going to do that, don't put a vernitherm. What are you going to do, block the oil? Like, no oil. Nope. <laughs> you know, the, the engine starves until it's warm. So the vernitherm valve is going to be, um, when it's cold, it gets smaller, it shrinks, you know, cold things do. And so it's going to have a passage that's going to allow it to bypass. It's going to be easier to go around the oil cooler because the oil cooler makes a wonderful uh, oil filter. They're very tiny little passages. The oil doesn't necessarily want to go through it, especially when the oil is cold. So it's going to bypass, go around. If the vernitherm is open, it's going to, well, then we're going to go through this open passageway and to the rest of the engine. But as the engine heats up across this, this will swell out. And that, that's one of the ways you check it. Just get some boiling water and throw it in there and measure it. Um, it will swell. It will close off that passage that bypasses the oil cooler and force all of the oil through the oil cooler. So what are we learning? Oil cooler, then engine, right? So it goes to the engine, and then we, we, the same as what we just covered. It's going to go through the bushings, uh, main bearings, main bearings are the bushings, uh, oil gallery to the tappets. Uh, I know, I think we did cover that one, okay. Um, this is just Lycoming's lubrication diagram, which we covered. Let's see if we can do it. Suction screen, oil pump. Oil pump, this one makes more sense. Oil cooler bypass valve. If it's open, the oil will go this way to the pressure screen. If the oil cooler bypass shuts down, then the only way for the oil to go is out here through the oil cooler back up and around. And that's through these hoses right here. Right there and right there, there. So it's a remote mounted oil cooler. So it'll go around that oil cooler, back up. What happens if one of those oil cooler hose, hoses break? Then all the oil goes overboard, and then you see that. All right, pressure screen or filter, um, and then it's just going to go off and, and uh, vacuum pump, vacuum pump drive around the oil relief valve. And so remember, the oil relief valve is on the case. It's that little ball. If we have too much pressure, it's just going to open up a little bit and add a little bit of a leak, and it drains back to the sump. If not, it's going to go around. Um, we got the left and the right. They call it oil header. I call them oil galleries. 
and we've covered it on that engine right there but you can see it goes up to the main bearing crankshaft idler gears crank pins main bearing main bearing um, across the back and so on and so forth all right uh, this is the rear of a Continental oil uh, accessory case. So these are where the oil, oil screens go. Here's where the pressure relief valve is. I don't know, it's the same thing. It sucks it up through the gears, through the outside, back around, through the screen, out the screen, to the engine. This one. Oh, okay, so this is... Um, this is a dry sump. So I needed to cover this a little more detail. And apparently this is the Bonanza one. I want to say that there's something wrong with this though. So let's see if it comes to me. All right, the oil system. In the Bonanza's oil system, oil is fed to the engine oil. Uh, let's just take a look at it. So we have the engine case. This is the sump right here. So it's a dry sump. So you're not going to have much oil in there. We have a remote mounted tank. Okay, so how does this work? Well. Let's take a look. Here's the oil pressure pump. So the oil pressure pump is going to draw from the bottom of the tank the oil up. What do we have right here? We have the ch a check valve, a screen, oil temperature, temperature bulb. Why do we have a check valve? Check the pressure. Well, I think the first problem is I believe this oil cooler tank belongs up here. And yeah, it's kind of drawn funny. And what you don't want is the oil. Yeah, there's something wrong with this. Because I tell you, with our Bonanza, one of the problems we have is the check ball is bad. And let me think. The tank is about here and the sump. Yeah, so the tank right, is higher than like the sump. 70. And so what's happening is oil from the tank is going down through the gears that aren't running while it's just sitting. And it's slowly filling up the crankcase. So when you go out there and you pull the dipstick oil level gauge out of the oil cooler tank, you're like, wow, it is really empty. And so you go get four quarts of oil and you fill up the oil cooler, fill up the tank right here, and you start it up. Well, you had about four or five cases right here, uh, uh, quarts of oil, and the scavenge pump picks it up, and before you know it, it's shooting out of the oil tank. So in our Bonanza, boy, you do not, just trust me, there, you know, start it up, run it for a minute, then shut it down and say, okay, well now let's check the oil. So, yeah, this is drawn a little, little fun funky. Yeah, it says it down there, too, that it's supposed to be mounted just above the first engine. I can't remember. I wrote this. In the banana, is oil is fed the engine oil from supply tank mounted just above and behind the engine. Okay, I was right. The return oil is picked up by a scavenge pump is returned to the supply tank passing through a cooler, which is an integral part of the tank. The oil tank capacity is to... Twelve gallons. That's supposed to be two and a half gallons. Well, it's accessible raising and lifting Door. That's not important. Dipstick. No. Tank clear. Both oil pumps and check valve. Uh, both oil pumps, the oil screen and check valve to prevent oil from draining from the tank into the engine sump are incorporated in the accessory section. Yeah, I was right about that. There is no engine oil shutoff valve, and the system is, is so designed that oil bypass uh, arrangements are unnecessary. Okay, so I was right. This goes up here, and it leaks down, and it's filling up the engine case. Um, okay, so it goes through the engine just like normal, falls down into the oil sump just like normal, but then we have a scavenge pump that has to then pick it up and send it to the oil tank, which is higher. And there should be um, a, let's see if I can draw it in here. Okay. There should be a, um, an oil, we'll call that the uh, vernotherm. A vernotherm valve that is going to either send the oil through the oil cooler or bypass it so that you have a choice one way or the other because you don't always want it going through the oil cooler so follow that okay uh, scavenge pump bigger bigger than a oh, pressure pump Scavid pumps are always larger. Why? Because you have air in there. Air, foamy oil, you have it, the volume becomes bigger. So scavenge pumps are always much bigger. Not, it's not funny. It's not even a little bit like, ah, I kind of see a difference. It's like, whoa, that's a really big pump. Okay, that's the scavenge one. So 
as compared to the pressure pump. In a, like a 470, 520, um, I want to say the pressure pump is about twice, twice that. They're just thicker. And then the scavenge pump is like four times. They're about that, it's about that long. Oh yeah, it's, it's huge compared to these. This is a very tiny little pump. I'm surprised, I like coming gets away a tiny. Continental uses a big old pump, it's giant. Okay, so that's the important thing. Things you need to know. The scavenge pump is bigger than the pressure pump and that had a vernotherm right there. I don't think it's a test question. Um, all right, got that. I can't believe I don't have any notes on this one. I really thought it would have. Well, all right. I don't know if I have any, I don't think I have major test questions on this. We'll see. No test tomorrow, by the way. We'll do it Monday. Uh, okay, so I talked about the, the, um, He's out of here. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I needed. <laughs> so Lycoming has the uh, uh, AEIO, like 360s, AEIO 360s in the um, AIO 360s. So there's the A and the AE. And I see the bottom one is the AE. And it was a really weird engine, and I can't even find a picture of it. And so it had a sump on the top. So, I mean, look how the engine's actually built. Uh, yeah. I can't see some of it if you're at home. Sorry. But, oh, there we go. Um, so under normal operation, this is the sump, right? And so it had a little check valve here. And so... And another check valve here. So this became the breather was kind of normal. And then when you went upside down, these ball valves changed position. The oil went this way. Then this became the breather out that way. And then these lines swapped. And so this picked up from like here for the oil that now goes through this way, this way into the gears and out. So it was a really strange engine. Like I said, I've never seen one. I can't even find a picture of them. Oops. As opposed to, normally, this is what they do now. Um, I'm sorry, this is the whole aerobatic. Oh, I screwed up. This is just a Christian system. Let me see, did it do that? No, it's just a Christian system. Um, I don't even do the, I don't even have a picture of the, the other one. They just drew it funny. That's what I thought. I don't know why they drew it funny like that because that's what it looks like. But this is the Christian system. So normal flight, ball check valve, it's how they do it. And so this is breathing and then this is inverted. That's what I did. Yeah, I just did it backwards because that's the sump up there. So let me try that one more time. We'll just edit that part out. This over here is the Christian system. That's why there's pictures of it. So if you work on any aerobatic aircraft, pits, uh, you know, any modern, like I say, modern day aircraft, you're gonna see the Christian, the Christian, oil system, no reference to its belief system. Mm -hmm. This is the ball check, the check balls there. There's the oil separator right there. That's an IO360, 200 horsepower engine. Normal flight, everything works normal. Suction, gears, two engine, blow by, through the ball valve, and out. Inverted flight, these little check ball valves are going to fall the other way, so they're always falling down. And so when it falls down, this it's going to suck it out what used to be the breather, up through the ball check valve, pump, and out. So sorry, I screwed that up. Uh, what else I got? We did that. Okay, we did all that. Cool. Don't worry about that. All right, um, let me see, what do I want to do? Oil coolers, what number am I on? 20. 
Right, so many engines use oil coolers. There are some that don't. I'm just going to try spelling again. Engines use oil coolers. They are little radiators. Uh, Lycoming tends to use remote. Lycoming uses remote coolers. Meaning, yeah. Um, earlier you said that the scavenge pump is bigger than the pressure pump. Yep. There's, there's air. There's air. And stuff. Yep. Does that imply that your pumps are self heating, your oil system is self heating to get rid of some of the air in that system? Nope. So wouldn't that cause problems? Nope. Once it goes into the oil sump, mm -hmm. air can float to the top. And then the oil pump is going to pick it from the bottom up anyway, where there's not as much air, and then blow it around. So Lycoming uses remote, which means that there are hoses, and it's mounted somewhere else. Uh, Continental tends to use, uh, uses coolers mounted to the engine, which means there are no hoses. The crankcase itself is machined out and accepts an oil cooler that bolts right onto it. And so the, the case itself has the outlets and the inlets already built into it. So without the oil cooler, it would just dump it all over the ground. So you have to have the oil cooler on as part of the whole system. Um, they look like small radiators. They look like small. What did you guys have for dinner, man? I had chili and I'm doing all right. Um, they have very small passages. They have very small passages. And as I'm talking about this, they're, they're aluminum, and so they have high heat dissipation. Very small passages um, through cooling fins. Through cooling fins. Um, that dissipate heat, that dissipate heat. And how are these cooling fins cooling? Are they just air? Oh. <laughs> so air blows across it and through the radiator, just like your car, and dissipates the heat. So, uh, um, they make really good oil filters. So things I've seen. I remember we had an, a customer and their engine made a whole bunch of metal, aluminum, and so they brought it in and it was overhauled in our shop. This is before I was in the engine shop. And, and uh, of course it had an oil cooler and it's like, well, what are we gonna, you know, what are you gonna do with that? Well, guy took it over to our, like, you know, the, the parts washer we have over, off in the corner. Basically he just hooked it up to one of those things and turned it on and let it run for a day. So, what that really does is it cleans out our parts washer <laughs> because if there's any blockage whatsoever it's going to go in and see the blockage and it's just going to find another passage it's going to find the passages that are clear until the debris from our parts washer plugs that and it's going to go to the next and the next and so in effect you're not cleaning out the cooler at all and you're just doing more damage in, than anything else. And so then you bolt it up to an engine. So I know parts washers only, you know, a couple of PSI. Ours wasn't even that strong. And then it wasn't a constant displacement pump at all. And so then you bolt it on the engine, then you start it up with all the high oil pressure, and then you start blowing passages out, you know, putting all that contamination back in the engine. So I tell you that to say, if you're gonna work on an oil cooler, if you have any sort of contamination at all in your engine, your prop, anything, you got to take the oil cooler and you got to send it off somewhere. And they actually take off, they desolder a side or both of them, and they use brushes and get in there and physically brush out every one of those little passages. So you can't just flush them. So it's, it's pretty much, you're, you're saying that the oil cooler acts kind of like as a filter. And when you were explaining the, the way the oil goes, it goes the, through the pump, then through the oil cooler before getting to the fi actual filter. Um, it should go filter then oil cooler. Oh, okay. It was one of the diagrams showed it backwards. It might have. Shouldn't. Let me see. So, up. 
around, out. We'll look at that. There she goes. That way, um, let's see how it goes up. Yeah, because it's teed off right there. Up there, there's the vermitherm hole. There's the screen hole. So yeah, kind of does have a chance to go that way. Not so good. But it catches the debris, so that's the good news. So yeah, so if somebody complained that their engine was running a little bit hot, wouldn't be that much of a stretch to think about not only the vernitherm valve, but also, you know, how's your oil cooler look? People don't believe that they plug up like that, but they really do. Um, I used to use a Pacific oil cooler. They're good people. I haven't used them in a long time. So often, uh, contamination, foreign contaminant, foreign contamination gets caught caught in the small in the small passages or small openings small openings make sure they are clean make sure they are clean how are you going to clean it send it out, send it out. I think there's a lot of Q&A's on these oil coolers so some oil coolers so I don't want to skip anything. Some oil coolers have an inner and outer core. Have an outer and inner core. Don't have a picture. So very cold oil, oil bypasses bypasses the cooler and I I have one book that called that I call it the vernitherm or the oil temperature control valve but I actually had one on that on these dual, dual core called it a surge valve oops surge valve closed why they would call the surge valve I don't know Then, when the oil is oil is correct temperature, when oil is correct temperature, correct temp, oil flows around jacket. Oil flows around the jacket, which I often call tanks, because you have ta actually uh, like an irradiator, like in your car, you actually have tanks that go down either side, and so it's pumped in one tank. And it flows across the radiator into the other tank and out. So like it'll come what, in the top, fill up that tank, cross over, come out the bottom, and then go into the engine. Well, same thing with oil coolers. It's going to go into the oil pump into one side, go through the oil tank. You can just see a little tank on there. And then across the fins, and then out the other tank, and then back in. That's how it works. So when we talk about jacket, it would be like around it. So, uh, jacket, oil that is too hot flows through the cooling fins. So ABC oil that is too hot. And this is with the um, outer and inner core. Is too hot. Flow through cool flows through cooling fins. Um, in all engines, oil to the cooler is controlled by by what? Vernitherm. Hey, you guys. Are, okay, by a thermostatic control valve. Um, also called Vernitherm. Um, thermostatic control valve, oil cooler bypass, all that stuff. So we'll just say vernitherm. Um, so a cold valve, a cold valve is open and allows oil to bypass the cooler. As the vernitherm heats up, oh, that's what I wrote. As 
valve heats up. It expands and blocks off the passage, the bypass passage, and closes off. Closes off the cooler bypass. Forcing oil through the cooler. That was funny. Hey, I just thought of something. I was going to tell you guys all about it and looked down at my notes. I actually wrote it. Good thing. All right. Just something funny. Ish. So you have a housing that fits over here, and like in the older versions, um, you have a screen right there, and it has a vernotherm that kind of goes down the middle of the screen, and the top, on top of the screen is your oil temperature bulb. So it is a fact that a little bit of oil leaking through here that misses the cooler will actually get around the oil temperature bulb and tell you that your oil is really hot when it's only that little tiny bit of oil that's hot. <laughs> so you gotta watch for that. So that's more of, I think, where line comes in. So leaky vernotherm valve will show hot oil when it's not. I mean, just a slight, slight leak. It's just a tiny bit of oil is not going through the cooler. It's making, it's leaking onto the uh, temperature bulb. So uh, vernotherm leak. Um, a big leak, I could put that, um, a big leak uh, will cause too much oil, too much oil to bypass, causing hot oil, right? Um, a small leak. will allow a small amount of hot oil to falsely um, show high oil temp. This is like out of left field here. Q and A question. Well, I guess we're still talking about this. So for uh, some aircraft, some aircraft use um, use a, a door control air use. Well, let's put that a door to control airflow across the cooler. So instead of controlling the oil through it, you just block the door off. Let the oil go through it all the time, just close the dang door. All right now no air can get through there and then the oil is going to get hot. Then the door will open up and lets the cool air through and then it starts cooling down the oil. I have not seen that, but I know that there are some out there. Um, if you have a dry sump engine, dry sump engine, it is going to go scavenge pump. Actually, I, I um, did this in the uh, drawing for you. Scavenge pump to what? To cooler and then to tank. In that order, and that's a QA and a question I wrote here. Um, a wet sump is oil pump, bypass valve, oil cooler, then filter. That's what Oscar said. Oil is usually cooled after, this makes sense, after it has been a run through the engine. Burn the 
run through the engine. After is run through the engine and before it is sent to the tank. Oil is cooled after it is run through the engine and before it is sent to the tank. All right, I'll take that. That'd be a wet sump since it's a tank, which is redundant. Oil temp is taken. Does anybody remember when? Before, before it enters engine. What's up? Uh, dry sump. Jeez, yeah, it's late. Thank you. Okay, what should oil temp be? Should be at least how much? 180. 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. To do why? Yep. Evaporate water. All right, I think that's all I had to say about oil. Woo, dang, that was a lot. Is, is number eight still pertaining to dry sump? Is that why you were dry sump there? Uh, not number eight, number seven. Oh, okay. Number eight's for all engines, no matter what. Oil temp is to be taken before it enters the engine. Oh, okay, so six is wet sump, seven is dry. Yep. I kind of went back. It's all good. Yeah. Told you some of this stuff got, I don't know, it's like random thoughts I wrote down or something. Let me know when you're all caught up. Good? Yeah. All right. Let's talk about aircraft cooling now. Well, oil plays a huge part in aircraft cooling. It's you know the only liquid we really have running around there except for fuel. But other than that, our engines are air-cooled. And that is a thermal couple. There we go. Why it's there, I don't know. But since it's there and you're looking at it, let me talk to you about it. So the way we measure engine temperature is either going to, well, it is through oil temperature and some, but not all engines, not the small engines for some reason, they don't usually, but continental small four cylinders don't. But um, even my 182 only had one of the six cylinders measured temp, but we like to measure the cylinder head temperature. And there's two ways to measure the cylinder head temperature. Uh, way number one is this up here, which is a spark plug gasket. So spark plug is going to go right through that, and that becomes a spark plug gasket. Now, here's the funny thing about spark plug gaskets. It clearly states in the manual, you must discard and get a new spark plug gasket every time a spark plug is removed. Spark plug gaskets are cheap. My license to me was very expensive, so I will never risk my license by somebody's cheapness to not buy spark plug gaskets. Oh, what's a box of them cost? Like a hundred of them is like... $66 to aircraft fleet that just bought a box. Yeah. So they're like a six... 66, 60 cents for us. 60 cents a piece. Or, I don't know. Like yeah, they're dirt cheap. Yeah. Now a lot of mechanics say, yeah. oh, you just got to anneal them, right? And annealing is when you take a metal that has been work hardened and you heat treat it back so that it's soft again. Well, it's not a big secret. What you do is you put them on a big piece of safety wire or something. You take a torch and you just sit there and you get the copper gaskets until they're red hot, dunk it in water, and then they're annealed. Well, if you can find anything in the F any FAA official publication that allows you to do that, I would love to see it. So for mechanics who laugh at me and say, you're an idiot for spending money on spark plug gaskets, especially on your own planes since nobody's watching, 
why don't you just anneal them? I save all of my gaskets and I bring them to them. I go, here you go, <laughs> you can have them. I was just gonna throw them away anyway. So um, yeah, these aren't that accurate, don't love them. And I tell you that whole story to say, you don't change that gasket. So suddenly this gasket gets reused 100,000 times, but tell me that works, I don't know. Um, the more accurate way is a bayonet type. And if you look at more modern cylinders, well, even some old ones, have a little boss in the cylinder head. Most of your 290s have it. And that just screws right in there and that takes the cylinder head down. That's accurate. Now, there are some problems, like my engine had a cylinder heater. Sometimes they're called Tannis heaters, that's the name of the company, or cylinder heaters. And they're basically probes that look similar to this that plug into 110 and they get really hot. And so I had a pad about yay big. If you guys are too young to have water beds, it looks like a little piece of water bed. And it stuck this big, right to the case, it's that long. So right there, and then I had another one that big stuck to the oil sump. And then five of these, why five? Uh, because my aircraft was certified with one cylinder head temp gauge, which meant that you can't remove it. You have to have a cylinder head temp gauge on the number three cylinder of my airplane. It was certified that way. You can't take that out. And so this is plugging that hole. So five cylinders are heated. One was measured and then had two. So anyway, um, that was just removed last week. I just ripped all that stuff out. If anybody wants it, you can have it for free. It's uh, too warm. So I now have six of these. So how is an aircraft cooled? It is air cooled and it's called a pressure cowling. So if, if, when the cowling is installed and the engine is moving forward, because the prop does not have a whole lot of thrust in this area right here. I mean, it's this area right here. There's not much thrust there. So as the aircraft moves forward, and remember, you know, this is wider than the prop. So air is forced up in here and this is a high pressure area where all the blue is there is engine baffling baffling has two meanings one you can call the baffling is the metal stuff that goes all around the engine or some people are talking about the rubber seals so you can say the rubber baffling or just the baffling which is the metal and then say rubber indicating the rubber stuff so it it's dependent upon this rubber seal up here and the metal seals to direct the air down through these cylinders now the air is going to exit out the bottom, either it's got a fixed cowling with a little lip that as the air goes across it, it creates a little venturi, which is a low pressure area, so it's a low pressure down here, or like some planes have towel flaps that will actually drop down, and so the air is um, drawn out that way because it gets lower. So we'll just look at some pictures here for a few minutes and you guys can take off. So uh, beautiful airplane with beautiful baffling. But see what I'm saying about, you know, this is the air entrance right here. And this is the rubber baffle, and this is the, the, uh, the metal baffle right here. And I don't know why I picked this one. I just like it because this rubber seal shows a good representation. It's folded up. So it's folded up, and that door is going to come down around it. And as the air comes in, it's going to hit that rubber and force it against the door, causing a seal. If it was down, the air would just... Pfft, all right, that would not work. Um, Here's that lip I'm talking about. There's a fixed one. Here's like a 182 style or something where it's a retractable, so the pilot actually gets to control it. These are controlled on a radial engine, open, close. So you just, as you're flying along, you adjust the cow flaps as you want it. For, for takeoff, they're gonna be open. When you get up to altitude, start closing them. What do you think of this? This is like the worst picture in aviation to me. Okay, we can start with the fact that somebody wrote the compressions right here, yeah. wow. right? And this is a, this is a what, $60,000 engine? If somebody did that to my airplane, I would just come unfreaking glued. Um, so don't do that. This baffle right here, look at, so it's laying down. So the pressure is gonna come in here and just come down and it's just gonna vibrate. So these two cylinders right here aren't getting any cooling. They're just baking. Um, so this is all wore out, probably stiff as can be. That's, that's an embarrassment, uh, everything about that. That even, gets even worse. It's just folded over, it should be, yeah. So you don't, you don't wanna see that. It's positioned bad, it's, you know, it's supposed to be facing forward into the air, up, forward, this is not, uh, 
terrible, terrible, terrible. You also have to look for all these leaks coming around here. Like these are the magnetos right here, and this is the metal baffling. So it sits down against the engine. But of course, it's not cut perfect. You're going to have little gap. Yeah, what do you? I seal that up. Take some high temp uh, silicone and just kind of beat it all up in there. If you look at my engine, it's all. That's one of the first things I did. Got it home, sealed everything, and you know, get that air through there. This one's too short, wore out. Again, leaning down. Let's see. I like this picture because it shows, and this is hard to do, but you can, these are air leaks right here. Like I know I have one small one in my airplane. It's like, I'm just, it's got a little wrinkle and I just can't seem to get it out in that one spot. So you want it to lay flat. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's what it should look like, right? Nice rubber seal it goes this way. It's going to go up. This one's going to come forward. So when the air comes in, it pushes up against it. Again, if it's backwards, it just blows it out like a little flap. So that looks gorgeous. That's what it should look like. It's not a big deal. Look, see, they even used rubber seal around there, which is pretty impressive. All right, there we go. Enough for tonight. And then some, sorry. <laughs>